Hola y bienvenidos. Welcome back to season three of Tech Rise. Today we are celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month with some incredible lineup of Latino founders and some excellent judges coming your way. For those of you who are new to Tech Rise, I am Desiree Vargas Wrigley. I'm a two time Latina founder here in Chicago and executive director of Tech Rise by P33. We started it in partnership with Verizon to help support overlooked founders from across the Chicagoland area um, with all the way from idea stage to exit. So each week founders take the stage uh, and they have a chance to win somewhere between 25 and $50,000 to help build and grow their ideas. And the way it works is that they have about four minutes to pitch their businesses and then four minutes of Q&A with judges. And at the end, the judges have the unenviable job of having to go to select the winner for the day. And while they're deliberating, we're going to have a guest speaker from the Illinois Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and the Latinx Incubator over at 1871. So with that, I'm excited to welcome some of our judges to the stage. First, we'd like to introduce Colleen Egan. She's president and CEO for the Illinois Science and Technology Coalition Institute. And she's an incredibly accomplished leader, entrepreneur, and innovator who's especially interested in social impact and amplifying diverse voices and experiences. And most recently, she served as director of People, Culture, and Endless Possibilities at Clarity Partners. And for over two years, she began her career as an oncology nurse after graduating from Lewis University. I did not know that. Um, and she discouraged. She was discouraged by the slow adoption of technology in healthcare. She pivoted to becoming the founder of her own healthcare startup. She also co-founded and served as the chief operating officer for 212 Degrees, an award-winning design technology company with offices in Chicago. And now is also, are you allowed to announce your new project? I am. I currently am the president and CEO of the Illinois Science and Technology Coalition. And then um, at South by Southwest, we launched um, Migrate Ventures with my business partner to invest in um, immigrant and uh, refugee founders. And with two other organizations, created the American Dream Fund. So I'm very excited to be here. I didn't think you were going to go through all of that information, but no, thanks. Well, people, I want people to know how amazing you are and, and everyone else that's here joining us. And next we have Flavia Andrade. She is a native of Rio de Janeiro. Brazil, but had lived in the U.S. for over 20 years, mainly in Chicago. Her career revolves around innovation and product management, venture capital investment strategies, business and marketing strategies, business internationalization, management, and higher education. And she's the CEO and co-founder of IDL Ventures, an internationalization platform designed to support deep tech expansion between countries. She was responsible for designing IDL's model involving funds, incubators, accelerators, corporations, governments, and universities, making the internationalization process for early stage technologies sustainable and benefiting all ecosystems impacted. And she also has an exciting new project. So do you want to share that very briefly? Um, sure. I mean, it's hard to follow the steps of Colleen here. <laughs> it just became my new idol. Uh, but I'm really excited to be uh, connecting for sure. And Colleen, we have definitely tons to collaborate, and, you know, for sure, and, and synergies. Um, but yes, uh, the we are we launched uh, this year the first international well international innovation hub in Brazil with over fifty firms and one hundred and fifty corporations linked. So that's our first mainly uh, large hub, and we're launching the international talent exchange program at IHCC, which we, we, is also a partner. Yes, and we're going to bring you on to talk more about that on another episode, but it's really exciting, sure. and we'll put the link into the into the feed. And then last, we have Carlos um, Covarrubias. He is a senior associate with Hyde Park Venture Partners and has been with the firm since 2021. Prior to that, he was an associate at Mesero Financial in the private equity real estate team, where he focused on acquisitions and asset management. And Carlos was a co-founder and director at Angeles Investors and received his BBA at the University of Notre Dame. So Carlos, thank you so much for being here too. I don't know, you were on screen and then off, but I'm assuming that means you're still here. So, all right. Thank you for being here. And with that, judges, I'm going to have us go screen off and I'm going to welcome our first competitor to the stage. We have Lisandra Martinez from Bloxy. All right, we can see your screen. We just can't see your face yet. Oh, it says that the host has stopped my video. I think you might have to request it one more time. So go down to start video. Okay, there we go. okay. great. All right. Well, we are ready when you are. 
All right. Um, hello, and thank you for your time today. My name is Lisandra Martinez, and I'm excited to introduce you to our blockchain-based marketplace that enables anyone to commission custom art for a flat fee while empowering professional artists to monetize their skills and connect with customers. At Bloxy, we believe that everyone loves art and that it holds immense value, not just emotionally, but culturally and economically. It's a $64 billion market. However, we recognize the challenges faced by individuals and businesses when it comes to commissioning custom art. The buyer has to spend a lot of time searching for an artist that fits their needs and budget, while the artist has to spend time marketing themselves and negotiating with potential clients. Our platform solves these problems by combining blockchain and artificial intelligence technology to provide an efficient and seamless process for commissioning custom art. We offer a flat fee for our service, which includes tools to find the perfect artist for the job, handling all the logistics and ensuring that both the buyer and the artist are satisfied with the final product. But we're not just focused on serving art buyers. We're also committed to empowering professional artists. Bloxy provides artists with a platform to monetize their skills and connect with customers so they can focus on what they do best creating beautiful art. At Bloxy, customers can commission a custom work of art in three easy steps. On our platform, customers can one, select their artist and preferred artistic style, two, share their story and provide artistic direction using our tools. They can even choose their color palette and upload images to inspire the artist, and three, select how they want to enjoy their work of art. Whether it's framing it, putting it on a canvas, or even water bottles or mugs, our artists will complete your commission in three to four days. There are three unique features that make Bloxy unique from other marketplaces. We use blockchain to verify authenticity and ownership and provide artist royalties. We integrate AI to personalize the experience uh, and make tailored recommendations. And we leverage smart contracts to manage commercial use licensing and protect artist IP. Our business model is simple. We charge a flat fee of $249 for personal use commissions and $499 for commercial use. We keep a 35% commission on those sales and our artists keep 65%, ensuring fair compensation for their work while keeping art affordable for our customers. We also generate a 10% royalty on commercial use and secondary sales. We believe there's a massive opportunity uh, with more people than ever interested in buying and collecting art. It's a $64 billion market together with a $30 billion personalized gift market and a $242 billion corporate gift giving market. We think commission art will be the next big wave and we are building a platform to capitalize on this opportunity. Although we are in the early stages of our business, we've conducted extensive market research and have identified several potential target markets, including nonprofits, philanthropic organizations and high growth tech startups. While there are existing art marketplaces and custom gift giving platforms, none have fully leveraged the power of blockchain and AI technology like Bloxy, our unique combination of personalized art, seamless experiences, and transparent pricing sets us apart from the competition. In the last year, we've added nine artists to our platform and built our MVP. With our attractive pricing model, growing artist community, and average card price of $500, we anticipate facilitating over 20,000 commissions in year three and estimate over 10 million in projected revenue. The $25,000 from this competition will be used to cover expenses related to product development, marketing, and team expansion, and help us get to our next milestone. Bloxy is backed by a team of talented individuals who are experts in blockchain technology, AI, and business development. I'm the former director of the Women's Business Center here in Chicago and have been obsessed with empowering underestimated communities through entrepreneurship for the last decade. And we're all driven by a passion for art technology and making the commissioned art, making commissioned art accessible to all. Whether you want to commission a diverse artist from our community for your next custom work of art to decorate your home, corporate swag, or to auction at your next gala or fundraiser, please reach out to us. Our contact information is on the screen, and thank you so much for your time. Great job, Lisandra. Um, all right, judges, you want to come on? And Colleen, can you kick us off? I am coming. I have so many questions, but I'm going to try to keep it Sure, just because my wife is an artist. Um, so I'm really excited about this. And I was just at Artsy this morning looking at an artist I love. So I'm glad you put them in there as your competition. Um, I have a quick question. Yes, I agree with the market size. But when you're talking about average cart price of $500 for commissioned artwork, that seems really low. So um, what kind of art is currently being sold or being purchased? Absolutely. So when a customer comes on our platform, the first step is uh, commissioning the actual work of art. So it starts off as a digital work of art. 
Um, and once the artist completes the digital rendering, uh, the add-ons then increase the market, the cart price. And so, you know, you can add your digital art to a canvas, a frame, corporate clients can add it to water bottles. And that's where that, that average cart price starts to increase significantly. And artists are essentially in a partnership and earning royalties on those add-ons that the clients um, include. Cool. So your focus is on digital art because I'm thinking commissioned oil paintings, things like that. Got it. That makes a lot more sense. So um, just one more thing. I love the commission breakdown. Great, because most are charging 50 to 75 percent. Um, so are you finding more individual buyers or corporate buyers? So our biggest opportunity as far as impact and really leveraging the digital technology is with our corporate artists, our corporate partners. So nonprofits, philanthropic organizations, uh, and high growth tech startups, for example, are able to really leverage the impact, especially when it comes to corporate gifting and promotional gifting. And how are you finding your artists? Oh, wait, sorry, I got to cut you off and get some other judges in yeah, there. Sorry. sorry, Flavia, do you have a question? Well, uh, first of all, I mean, Colin, you, you, uh, I can see you know, you're very knowledgeable of this space. Um, definitely, I'm not as much. Um, but the, I have a question regarding uh, part of your go-to-market strategy and the growth. Um, so a lot of, I didn't see any strategic partnerships. And how is it that you uh, intend to leverage your channel partners or if you have any strategy related to that for your growth? Absolutely. So we plan for the last year, we've been building and educating creatives um, around blockchain and Web3 technologies. So our way of attracting artists has been through education, empowerment tools, which really aligns with our mission for them. And as far as strategic partners, we want to work with colleges, art schools, universities, art organizations um, that are supporting artists and the creative community to start spreading the word of the work we're doing, the impact we're trying to drive and really start to attract uh, artists to our, our platform as well. Carlos. Well, that is, sorry, it's just one follow-up question on that. Um, we don't have time. I'm sorry, Carlos, oh, you have I'm a quick sorry. question? Okay. Just real quick, how do you maintain the connection between the digital and the physical or does it not matter because you're focused purely on the digital? So the connection between the digital and the physical is that once you once the artist completes your digital piece, you're able to create your physical aspect to it. You're supposed you're able to create the physical object. So that digital file is then able to be put on a canvas, a mug, a T-shirt, water bottles in a frame. And um, that those are add ons that you're able to include through our platform. Thank you. All right. We have four seconds, so I'm going to cut us off now, but a great job. And and judges, thank you for bearing with me on the time constraints and Lisa, did an excellent job. Um, judges, we're all going to go uh, video off as I welcome um, Brian Nieto with Ale Brije. All right. We can see you, but we can't hear you yet. And we can see your screen, but we still can't hear you. Here we go. Perfect. All right, ready? All right. ready when you are. Awesome. <clears throat> Bench. Oops, sorry. Here we go. Did you know that 63% of restaurants use social media as their primary form of advertisement? It's no wonder restaurants are continuously trying to keep up with social media. Uh, however, while working with many restaurant owners, we realized that there are three continuous problems. One, limited time for quality content, low marketing budgets, and owners often hire the wrong influencers. So that's why we developed Parley, the app that connects local restaurants with local foodies. And we say local foodies because we're really focused on the people that are excited talking about food rather than the people that would identify as an influencer. The way that the application works is a restaurant can list a paid collaboration on the app. The content creator can then see what's being offered. They will then go to the restaurant, take the content, and submit it for approval. After approval, the um after approval, the creator gets paid. Now we know that there's a market for this because in 2023, we we're expected to reach $72 billion in social media advertisement. And while looking at our obtainable market, we were extremely conservative and we only focus on the restaurants within Chicago, New York, and Nashville. However, this tool could be used for different sectors within the within the hospitality industry. 
Our go-to-market strategy is simple. We're going to launch in Chicago. We're going to collect data, generate revenue, and all of that so we can start launching our first campaign that's going to be targeted to getting more restaurants and more content creators. All of this as we generate our first million dollars. And we plan on doing that by getting at least a thousand businesses to spend at least a thousand dollars with us. And we know that this is possible because we currently have two case studies with one customer spending around 30,000 and the other one on 15,000 in similar services. All of this as we're refining the app and ensuring that we have a product market fit. Now, like many other restaurant tools out there, we're going to allow the customer to say how much they want to spend per campaign from zero all the way to thousands. However, our biggest differentiator is scalable word of mouth marketing. And we achieve this by giving access to the restaurant, uh, giving access to multiple channels of communications through our users. Our business model is simple. $36.99 gives you access to the platform. And once you have access, you can list an exchange. So think meals, drinks, or you know, free uh, free dinner parties, or they could list a paid commission. Um, if it's a paid commission, 10% of that transaction comes to us. If we were to get the, the price money, 45% of it will go towards key hires, turning some of our part-timers into full-timers. 30% goes into testing and marketing, and 25% of it will be into uh, going into uh, legal and operations. If we're resourceful, we could additionally we could easily add an additional six month of runway for a business. And we know that now is the perfect time to launch this app because after COVID, restaurants are adapting new technology. The creator economy is booming and currently worth around two hundred fifty billion dollars and generating a lot of social currency. We want to leverage that social currency and uh, to convert it into actual sales for the restaurants. And we know that this is doable because eighty six percent of Gen Z and millennials that were surveyed said that. They would post sponsored content if compensated. Our team is on a mission to disrupt the restaurant marketing industry, and we know that this app can do that and have a positive social impact. So later next week, our app, uh, our MVP will be ready for testing, and in December, people can join the party. Thank you. Great job, judges. Can you come on? And Flavia, I'm going to have you join or uh, start the questions. And Brian, you want to take the presentation down so they can see your face? Yeah. Uh, All right, go ahead, Flavia. Um, uh, very good presentation. Uh, so in regards to, it seems like a very hard market um, for you to you know, compete against influencers, despite like how much you're actually, uh, the other owners are actually spending. Um, so out of your case studies, what has been your, uh, have they mentioned how much they are gaining out of it, like in terms of growth or uh, seeing the difference between the using other services or how, how is that experience? Uh, so, so far we've done a few to uh, test uh, testing. However, um, in terms of the app, we haven't really launched the app just yet. We're uh, the most of ourselves are coming from traditional, uh, you know, getting the influencers in and out of the restaurants that way. And uh, so far we are, Customer lifetime cycle is around 15 months. So they're definitely coming back for the service. Carlos. How do you, and this can be either the supply or demand side, so either the restaurants or the influencers, but it seems like there's a lot of these, both um, manually or digital. So how mm -hmm. do you attract them to you as opposed to others? Yeah, so uh, one of the key things that we're going to be um, in incorporating here is the service, right? So if we are able to um, utilize the uh, the service staff to be able to almost function as salespeople for us, it's going to be huge. Uh, later this month, we're going to do our first trial with uh, a restaurant here in Pilsen. So we'll let you know how that goes, too. Colleen? You mentioned a first trial. I thought in the presentation you had mentioned maybe a $15,000 client that you're consulting with? Mm -hmm. Yes. So right now what we're, what this actually just streamlining one of our sources of revenue, because right now we're have, we're, uh, doing like a traditional agency model where we're contacting all the influencers we're doing all this other stuff and we're posting all of things and it's, everything is very manual. So this app essentially streamlines all of that. But you've already tested with one company already. They're paying you. Have they ha had great success? Uh, yes. So in fact, we're, uh, they're actually want to make me uh, one of the restaurant partners. So that comes through later this month too. Cool. Thank you. We actually have time for quite a few more questions. So anyone have another question? 
How do you measure attribution? So post advertisement, how does the restaurant what can what is it considered successful or not? Yeah, so we're still working on that for the uh, for the technology part of it, but the goal is to get uh, links, and we're gonna be able to track this. So if we uh, right now we're currently track their reservations through like Open Table. So if we're able to uh, leverage a partnership with any of those uh, um, companies, that that's solid, right? That that's how we will one hundred percent track be able to track that conversion rate. All right. Any more questions? What medium is most effective? Or is it based on the influencer? Um, so right now, <laughs> restaurants love to see to see them uh, being posted on Instagram, but we're realizing that Google uh, Google uh, reviews are actually the most effective right now because of the SEO. We have time for one more. If not, Brian, do you want to add any final thoughts before you go? Uh, no, we're definitely just excited for next week. It's going to be a big, uh, a big week for us. So I'll let you, I'll put everything situated and send you guys uh, invites when this thing goes live. Well, we wish you a very successful restaurant week and uh, and pilot and um, great job. And we are going to um, all go a video off and welcome on um, our next competitor. And we have um, Edis Lima from um, Cur sorry, Curiba. Hello, everybody. All right, can't see your screen yet, but can hear you and see you great. I believe it's loading. There okay. you are. Yes, you're good to go. Perfect. Curiva's on a mission to transform the way in which gynecologic cancers are detected. I'm Adi Slima, I'm founder and CEO. And at Curiva, we believe real-time diagnosing is the best approach to cervical cancer prevention. I realized this was such a big problem when I was working at Yale University doing ovarian cancer research, and I met multiple LEs. Um, these were all the patients that were being diagnosed at a later stage and therefore not really making it through treatment um, and having not such great outcomes. So it is a global problem, and Cura's focus on the five-year prevalence rate here that you see the 11.7 .7 million women that are still lagging and don't really have uh, improved five-year survival rates or better quality of life. Diapatch is a revolutionary early detection wearable diagnostic patch for detecting cervical cancer to begin with, ovarian, endometrial, uh, and so on. It provides fast results during the clinical visit as early as 30 minutes, and it is applied externally via microneedles, which allow it to be completely non-invasive. The assay is a really unique synthetic riboregulator, which is able to pick up different biomarkers of interest, and these are all microRNAs. Results are given, as I mentioned, during 30 minutes, and there's higher specificity of 99.5 and sensitivity of 98% due to this novel assay. In conjunction with the wearable, we'll have an app in order to get results uh, quickly deliver to enhance patient education, streamline physicians' workflow. So at this time, a physician seeing two or three patients at the, as they're waiting for their results. Um, ease of referral. So imagine having the doctor and the patient already make the decision of who's the best um, top three or five gynecologic oncologists in the area that they can go see. And of course, this would have to integrate into electronic health records. The market is large. <laughs> We're talking here only of $14.1 billion, but that's of the women that are in need of testing um, at a global scale. Through the NSF i program, we did intensive market research uh, and discovered that high-risk patients with CIN2 and 3, which is the stage where there's a lesion of cervical cancer, are our primary target. Um, they're the ones that need it the most. So imagine going to your doctors and instead of having to get a pap smear or a colposcopy, this patch is applied and results and a plan for treatment or, or surgery is um, addressed right away. From there, we'll uh, move into the ovarian cancer market as well as uh, breast oncology. 
This is our fantastic team, which is composed of well-balanced technical and business individuals. Um, our CSOs with Northwestern Medicine and leading one of the top research science labs in the nation uh, in gynecologic oncology. We also have Scott Kozak, who's an entrepreneur in residence with, with Yale Ventures, and I try to keep our networks together. So we function as a triangular approach. Our, our advisors here are some investors. We have um, fundraised up to 175 thousand dollars with the three doctors and the retired PwC doctor really seen here. And we have Dr. Gilmore, who's been my mentor since the uh, Yale uh, days. Our business model is simple. Initially, we're doing a data service, so we're contracting with cancer centers and selling our, our patches uh, in bulk at a thousand to five thousand um, dollars, and that's currently an inexistent market. Uh, from there, we would do, uh, do the patch for $100 or $200 for the pap smear, sorry, for cervical cancer and then ovarian cancer at $350. These are our financials. And the $25,000 will go towards the, developing the initial 100 patch units at MHUB. We now have a $150,000 sheet I'm looking to match. This is how you'll capitalize. And thank you for your time. Uh, the patch is a non-invasive uh, first step to get us to detect cervical cancer earlier. Thank you, Edis. All right, judges, come on. Um, and I'm going to start with you, Carlos, for the first question. Perfect. I, um, since I'm not as familiar with the space and it seems more like med tech, um, the question I have two, but the one I'll ask is just talk about like the, FDA process and all of the, the regulation that you have to go through and where you're at in that process. Can you also click yeah. on your, so your screen? Are submitting. Yeah, so, okay. All right. the rules here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we're currently working to submit the investigational device exemption form, which means that once we have that um, and it's sealed, stamped, we are able to do research studies. So getting to the first clinical pilot. And that of course would be done at Northwestern Medicine with uh, Dr. Duria Roque and um, Daniela Mate. Thank you, Colleen. Yeah, um, going through that myself right now on the breast side, wish there was a patch for that. Um, but I was an oncology nurse, so I have a lot of questions, but I'm gonna try to keep them short. Congratulations on the i -Corps. Did you work with a local state university? We actually did the San Francisco cohort. So we went from regional all the way to the national one. And right. we wanted to pressure test ourselves in that environment of Silicon Valley. So we interviewed people at Stanford, UCSF, et cetera. Um, and all did the responses you... were, can we have this tomorrow? <laughs> no, no, that's perfect. And did you apply for SBIR funds? We have two grants that are already submitted and we're awaiting to hear. Okay, that's all I have for now, thanks. Flavia. Um, again, congratulations. This has been a, a very novel idea, definitely. I mean, there's not much. I mean, there is a few things going on on, on that space. Um, we we are on the other spectrum. I mean, we have a, a company that basically is the cure for cervical cancer, so it's very exciting in an immunotherapy area. Um, so uh, my question is related. You already mentioned about the FDA and, and where you're going in terms of grants. Um, but then it's, uh, have you, I didn't see much of your competition market there for, for that space. And of course, it's all about the, the cost and the adoption, right, from the, from the clinicals. And everything. Certainly. So as you saw from the business model, there's an inexistent um, service, so software as a service for centers to have biomarkers that can be adapted cyclically like per patient. So in a personalized medicine manner, but also um, as the patient's undergoing a surgery, when the cancer will come back. So our initial product doesn't have any competition at the moment because it is us providing information on the biomarkers of interest. From there, uh, the one for cervical cancer, um, there's really Roach, which is the major player, but they still have to do the saw with the pap smear, which is extremely invasive, and they have to analyze everything in a large bulk equipment in the lab. Um, for ovarian cancer, there's CA125, and although <laughs> the novel prize winner, <laughs> Adam B. Anderson, is a fantastic doctor, it's a test that still falls shy of what else can be done 
right away. And it's a test that doesn't really allude to early detection. All right, we have five seconds left. So I'm gonna say thank you so much, um, Adis, and great job. And next we are gonna welcome um, Molly and um, Andrew Ramirez to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I like your warm background. <laughs> thank you. All right, we can see and hear you. I'll wait till you're in presenter mode and then let us know when you're ready. Perfect, I am ready to go. Hi everyone. Today I come to you on a mission to rescue digital Main Street from the wrath of social media advertising behemoths like Instagram and Facebook. When I started on my journey as a founder and digital marketer 10 years ago, these apps were our most powerful asset. We were the early adopters and millions of digital first brands like mine won because of it. We used organic content to hack these apps in ways that these platforms didn't want doing things like lead generation, hosting live auctions, and live broadcasting promotions. And over the years, Meta's algorithm turned off that faucet on organic engagement in an effort to force everyone to adopt its advertising platform, which honestly makes sense. The problem with Meta's ad platform, though, is that it's a complex tool. It's built for corporate America and big advertising agencies, not Main Street. These people are makers and doers. They're not advertising experts. Big tech has failed its most important customer. Every brand, regardless of size, deserves an arena where they can be put on display in front of an audience that's looking for brands just like them. A place to be discovered and transact in a variety of fun and engaging ways. So that's how Mully came to life. Our mobile app uses contests, sweepstakes, product drops, and auctions to help brands be discovered, generate leads, and sell more products. Think of Mully like a marketing arena that we fill with a highly targeted audience. And our brand partners, they're the headlining show. When you open the app, you see a personalized feed of brands and promotions, along with a gamified user experience where we're taking a play to earn approach. For example, every day that a user checks into our app, we reward them with one free giveaway entry, plus bonuses when they hit streaks and milestones. It's not complicated and it really works. Our traction shows just that. Our early users love us and we're onboarding them for less than $1.50 each using simple scalable campaigns. Then on the back end, brands unlock powerful profile and behavioral data about their audience, which they can use directly inside of Mully's CRM or inject into their existing marketing stack. The result is a win-win situation for everybody. Now we're currently pre-revenue, but our B2B to C model provide several revenue opportunities, but B2B monthly subscriptions are the largest. And golf was an easy decision to target as our go-to-market. Uh, it's a $100 billion industry already, and it's growing faster than ever before. I use my industry network to build a wait list with some of the most disruptive brands in golf, some of which are located right here in Chicago. We're riding golf's wave of growth and leveraging its overlap with other similar categories, making it easy for us to expand beyond the sport. Eventually, every business that sells something online will be using Mully. Our team has everything that it takes to pull this off. And our most recent partnership with one of Latin America's top technology firms gives us everything we need to catapult ourselves into the same conversation against the titans we're competing against. And I know that I probably sound crazy trying to come at the proverbial like 800 pound gorilla in the room, no offense to Mark Zuckerberg, but it's clear why Mully is different and more effective. We're the arena and the promoter. We provide the solution and deliver the results. And you don't need to be a creative director or advertising expert for it to work. I know that we'll earn our seat at the table next to those Titans with your help. We're bootstrapped so far, but your investment is coming at the perfect time. We would use it to finish developing Mully CRM so that we can onboard our waitlist and start generating revenue while we achieve our first 10,000 users. With these objectives met, we can get our seed round of $1 million across the finish line and take Mully beyond golf. So come on, let's save Main Street together. Thank you. Great job, Andrew. Thank you. All right, judges, come on. And um, Colleen, will you kick us off? Yeah, nice presentation, Andrew. And I like the simplicity of your slides. Um, so just wanted to start with that. Um, 
you mentioned something about the um, using Molly's CRM or their own marketing stack. Is there a simple integration between those two or you, do you really not want that to happen? Yeah. So ideally we want to keep everything within Molly's ecosystem, right? Keep them using it within the app on the front end and back end. Uh, however, in its early days, Molly was actually a lead generation tool for some of the brands that are on our wait list now. Um, so it was kind of um, our easiest uh, entry into the B2B side of the market was helping these brands generate leads and then selling that lead data to them. So it's kind of you know, to answer your question, we want to enable them to be able to use it, that data how they want, but while also incentivizing them to keep it inside of our app. And you didn't address your Sam or Tam. Do you know what your market is? Yeah. So, Numbers? I mean, yeah. So just in terms of my, on a micro level, um, manufacturing and golf is already just a $3 billion industry just here in the U.S. But looking beyond that, I mean, there are over 1.8 million small businesses in America that are selling things online and then millions of others that are on their way to doing the same thing. So in reality, from a big picture perspective, anyone who's a small business that sells something online qualifies as a customer of ours. Thank you. Flavia. Um, yeah, I, I, I did it. Did you mention anything about AI implemented in your platform at all for, cause I know a, lot, a few marketing tools that will be, you know, related to com competitors to you and they're already a bit ahead of you in terms of market share. So how do you, uh, I didn't say anything about that. So how do you integrate it if you will? Yeah, great question. I purposely left AI out of our business model. Obviously, you know, with the advent of generative AI and um, how it can help us personalize our experience on the customer side while also powering up the data for our brands on the back end. But we're in such a hype cycle with AI. I didn't want to specifically use it as like a marketing or branding technique inside of our pitch. But obviously, you know, as we're building this out, leveraging AI to help us, you know, create more value for both our customers on the B2B and B2C side is something we would, we'd like to do. Alice. Can you walk us through a transaction and how you would make money on the transaction? Yeah, absolutely. So the main would be a monthly subscription that would vary based on the size of the uh, list of active profiles that our brands are working with. We also are allowing um, our, on the consumer side, our brands to, or our, our users to bypass the play to earn um, method by, you know, paying to essentially bypass that. And then obviously any sales that are attributable, we would be taking a portion, you know, a small percentage of that as well. We have time for one more. What is the dollar twenty six acquisition cost? Like, how did you guys did you guys run a beta to get that, or what's that stem yeah, from? Yeah, good question. So we've been running a public beta throughout the summer, um, just running simple campaigns, um, mostly leveraging social media to be honest, and then putting them through our own funnel to get uh, customers on and interacting with the app. And the most interesting thing that we came across, other than you know those customer acquisition costs being ahead of schedule, was that. Um, you know, we're not running any type of referral program or anything like that, but our early users are actually doing it for us. And almost 15% of our new users every month are coming from people that are outside of that, the advertising campaigns that we're running, which is honestly causing us to fast track that, that referral program. All right. And we're at perfectly at time. Thanks so much, Andrew. And um, the rest of us going to go video off while we re welcome um, Ethan Rodriguez um, with Codify. All right, we can see, and I think we can hear you, so we're good to go when you are. Awesome. Well, this guy in the picture is me. I may look confident and fashionable, but it took a great deal of anxiety, stress, and days of shopping to find an outfit for to wear for this special occasion. I struggle a lot to buy outfits because I am short, I am husky, and also, being a Latino, I don't often see myself represented in fashion. My name is Ethan, and I am here to introduce you to Clotify, an app that will completely change the way you discover fashion. We actually surveyed thousands of people, and all of them have the exact same problem. And actually, 79% of them say clothes look different on them compared to models on fashion ads. Well, to solve this, we created Clotify, a fashion discovery app that allows you to find inspiration from people that have your same body and your same style. But let me show you how it works. You enroll in Clotify, you input your body measurements, your taste in, in style, and in just one toggle, voila, instant personalization. Now you can see content from people that have your same body and your same style. 
So if you like something that they are wearing, you can confidently shop for the outfit knowing it's going to look great on your body as it does on the content creator. Long gone are the days of unrelatable fashion inspiration, fake people, and unreal stereotypes. There are a lot of ways that people use online to buy fashion, social media, and online stylists, but Clotify is far better than all of them. First of all, Clotify is very inclusive. We include all demographics. Many of the fashion apps out there only cater to specific demographics, but not Clotify. And also from a user experience perspective, it is super easy to use. Just input your body measurements, click on a toggle and boom, instant personalization. The fashion e-commerce industry is actually valued at over $180 billion. There's a lot of people buying clothes online and we wanna give them an amazing shopping experience online, but also capitalizing on the opportunity through ad revenue from fashion brands, uh, affiliate marketing earnings from content creators, and also premium features for those people that just love to shop online. Our go-to-market strategy is very simple. We will start in Chicago because Chicago is the third largest fashion hub in the United States. We will use strategic partnerships with organizations like Indiana Fashion Week and also universities so that we can get into those fashion communities. We'll also give freemium access to fashion brands and content creators as we scale our platform. Our go-to-market, oh, sorry. Oh. Our team is more than ready to help people simplify their fashion discovery experience. I am the CMO. I have over seven years of experience in sales and marketing in the tech and retail industries. My team also brings over 40 years of knowledge in the tech and global operations industries, having worked in over seven different countries. We also have Denisha Ferguson in our team, who is a member of the Council for Fashion Designers of America. She's helping us also get in touch with a lot of fashion communities all around the nation. The $25,000 investment price will have a massive impact on Clotify because it will help us acquire 5,000 new app users and generate $12,000 in monthly recurring revenue from premium users paying $5 per month. Clotify's mission is very simple. We want to showcase the world of fashion through the eyes of real people. We hope you'll join us on this journey and I now open the floor for questions. All right, judges, you can join us on. And Flavia, you want to kick things off? Yeah, this is such a hard market. <laughs> uh, and uh, we see a lot of your large brands competitions even going towards a rental. Um, and at the same time, how hard it is to, to really get the, the, through your tool um, an exact match. I mean, it just seems uh, complex. So how are you going to be... Uh, tackling those those competitor news uh, uh, strategies towards Clotify on that sense. I don't really see it as a really competitive space. And when you talk about rentals, I mean, there is definitely a market for people that love to rent stuff, especially if they want to wear something that's really expensive. Maybe they don't have the budget to buy it for the one time, so they just end up renting it so that they can have that first experience. But when you think about everyone in the planet, everyone wears clothing, everyone has different budgets. For brands, it's impossible to hire people to represent every type of body, but the reality is there are a lot of people that look like us out there. Maybe they have a little bit more centimeters in their chest or in their uh, in their legs, but having a, a, the opportunity to actually see people that more closely resemble how you look is going to be a better experience for you than let's say you actually go to Instagram or Pinterest, you want to find something to wear for a wedding, and all you see are these very stereotypical bodies, and it just makes the experience longer and more stressful. So I guess that's how I see it. Carlos. How did you and the team get together or meet each other? So I actually met my co-founder Adriana through a mutual friend and we bonded over the same thing. We love buying clothes online. We're both Latino and we always have some package ready to get returned. I wish I had one here so I could just show it. Uh, but I usually have it there in the corner. And you know, also the idea of we we may look fashionable. A lot of people say, oh, you look very fashionable. But there's a lot of stress that's go, that goes behind finding the right shirt, finding the right outfit for a wedding, for a birthday. And it just honestly, sometimes people, it, it's really sad. And we were just thinking if there was a way to connect with people that look like me, instead of, let's say, I'm going to try Stitch Fix. They send me 20 packages. This not really It doesn't really match my style because the selections are very limited. I just want to see people that look like me. You know, because I have a I have a lot of tools, but the people that look like me are out there. I just don't have a way to find them. But it just one toggle. That's what how we thought of it. Like if I could just see people like me, I can see everyone, 
but I just don't want to see this girl because I don't want to see her. I'll just click on a button and I'll see people with my body and my style. So that's that's how we came up with it. Colleen. Only fashion. Clarify is just for fashion. I, I love this just because, you know, I'm a queer woman who definitely clothing is uh, genderless and I'm kind of non-binary with my choices, right? Which is why I usually have my clothing made because it's made for me, um, which so I love this. Um, but I'm wondering, like, uh, my daughter, my youngest is a huge rent the runway, um, person, right? And a lot of my staff use other services. Do you know if any of them are already creating something like this? No, a user generated content discovery platform. No, if okay. you want to see stuff that's from rent the runway, you would go to rent the runway. But the thing about Clarify is you can discover brands that maybe you don't know about rent the runway a lot of people know about it but let's say just another brand you can just find them another here yearly. but <laughs> you would then see all the content and you would be able to discover the brands and everything and i just quickly want to show you the algorithm so you input your body measurements and your tasting style so we're not asking if you're male or female we found in our research that it's completely irrelevant because someone can look one way and identify another and when you turn it off, I'm going to turn it off so you see how I now see everyone else in the platform. But if I turn it on, I'll only see people that look like me. We're in beta, so there's not a lot of content right now, but we do. We launched this quarter. Um, so hopefully there'll, there'll be a lot more. How many users on the platform right now? 120, and we have seven brands in the pipeline. Brand Thank profiles you. are also custom and really cute. You should go check them out. Final thoughts? Any final thoughts? Thank Ethan? you, Ethan. Okay, well, Ethan, great job. And thanks for a very entertaining yeah. end to it. And um, yes, sorry, Run the Runway was co-founded by another Yale. So I was going to just throw that block in. Sorry about that. But judges, great job. Thanks so much for um, your great questions. And now uh, we're going to turn you over um, to Sean, Sebastian, and Steve to go make a decision for who wins today's $25,000 prize. And while you're doing that, I'm going to welcome Adrian M. Rodriguez to the stage, who's director of 1871's Latin Tech Incubator. And it's great to have you, Adrian. Hello, hello, Desiree. It's a pleasure to be with you. I mean, I'm rejoining the Chicago environment, so it's a it's a really honor to share the stage with you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Um, well, hopefully you enjoyed these wonderful presentations today. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I it's incredible. I doesn't matter how many pitch competitions I am, I always learn a lot. I and I love all the energy, the passion, the technology. I always say this, it's not about the technology itself, the technology is the, 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 the vehicle, right? It's about the idea, the problem, and, and the problem leads to another solution and, and, every, and all that we build on top of, of many other, uh, other people's idea. So that's incredible, all the innovation happening uh, that happens in this type of rooms. So I'm gonna go off script right away, I hope that's okay. But you said you just came to Chicago, so where are you coming from? California, Silicon Valley. I, I've been two weeks in Chicago. Oh, well, you're here so just I in time for the weather. <laughs> I lived here before, okay. so I'm pretty used to, to Chicago, but uh, I, I've been two weeks in Chicago now. And so what brings you, like, what made you come back? Actually, thank you. Um, thank you for that question. Uh, before I was the director of policy here at the Yellow Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and through doing a lot of research, work, working with the Aspen Institute with Harvard University of Chicago, you know, all this academia and, and Dominican University also in a local, local stage, we wanted to find why, how to help small businesses, why small businesses don't grow or what, what is this, the key component, right? And building capacity for them was the key, right? But that is just the problem. How do you approach it? So we started to do analysis, data models, different things when I was doing uh, policy. Then we developed a model to do AI, interpersonal intelligence and, and machine learning to help them build capacity. Just think about this. It's in a small bakery trying to sell their bread to the local school district, right? Something that the chamber has been doing for the last 30 years is helping small businesses to participate in the public economy. The public economy, I mean, in the, in the last hundreds of years, it's something that has been centralized. So what we are doing is trying to decentralize this economy, helping a small, a small businesses to participate in the same economy they grow, right? The same economy. So basically what we're doing is extracting public value from the value created by the public. So that is not possible without the capacity so for that, we created this tool, this AI tool that actually was in the top four uh, the innovation projects in the world in Geneva, Switzerland this summer. Uh, we just presented that app as well in Washington two weeks ago. 
And the idea with the in because of this project has been uh, taking a lot of attention it is actually getting off the ground. Now I came back to Chicago to drive this project at the Illinois Expenditure of Converse that we are super proud of it. And you will learn more in the in the next in the next weeks and months. That's amazing. Um, so what kind of businesses are the you know great targets for this technology? It's uh, basically all small all to, all these small businesses. It can be construction. That might be depend on what is the local economy looks like, right? Let's say Chicago. Chicago is very heavy in construction. We just tested this in Waukegan, and Waukegan is more into uh, services, professional services. So that will depend on the what the local economy, what the demand looks like, right? So the what the what we do is basically just get uh, RFPs and match it with contracts in seconds, right? Match your company. But the idea for this is not uh, this is not designed for someone that actually has the personnel and the capacity that is already doing it. It's for those really small businesses that want to participate and they don't know how, when. In, 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 so what we're doing is to bring all these resources automa uh, automatize these all these resources for them to participate in the same economy. Their sons, their kids, and everyone everyone grow right. Yeah, amazing. So um. It, further off script, but here at P33, we're working on something called the exchange and in partnership with the civic committee where they have the business diversity initiative. And one of the goals there is to think about not just the first contract, but the subcontracting that happens to be able to support the, the larger $1 million, $5 million contracts. So we should definitely connect after this um, absolutely. to be able and to I mean, connect in, those dots. Absolutely. I mean, something that that is key. What you said, what you just said is key, right? Research. 2021, this party started construction in Chicago. If you look at the, if you look at, at when you when we get um, reports, everybody will always look at the subcontracts, and yet you had all these many subcontracts. Yes, construction 2021, we only got six prime contracts. Hispanics only got six, not six, not six percent, six. Yeah. So we know that, uh, and the average of the subcontracts is 150 thousand, but the prime is 15 million. So we only got six of those. The ratio for us is to every every 40, every 44 subcontracts you get a prime right so that is unacceptable by any measure that is because we are basically doing the work but not tapping into those prime contracts so what you're doing is fantastic the and actually we believe that is in an incredible pipeline to start building wealth in our community generational wealth within our community I completely agree. And one of the things I don't have data to support, but maybe you do, is the fact that when we um, we build upon these subcontracts, we actually force the subcontractors to compete with each other on price and create really small margins that end up penalizing the business owner. And so do you have any thoughts on how we can you know, improve that so it's more collaborative than, than competitive? Well... <laughs> that, that will depend on the industry specifically, yeah. because I mean, the... the the supply and reading the industry will give us a, a landscape of what exactly is right. Maybe if, if that is in construction, that's by all means uh, absolutely possible. If that is in professional service services, I uh, agree. But let's say let's go into aviation, right? That is is still and they are actually expanding right now with all this infrastructure bill and everything. Mm -hmm. So well, that'd be challenging. That'd be challenging by start finding companies in first place. So trust us, we've had an have, aviation. <laughs> pitch competition it is very hard to find <laughs> so it, that, that will depend exactly on the industry but i mean every every single uh touch point that we can have among industries among uh and the, all the connections that we can be elaborate to build a strong ecosystem it'll be awesome right not as a chamber of commerce but also as an hispanic so as an hispanic because strengthening the ecosystem for hispanic is it, it will be it, it is key to have all these businesses flourish in our in our in our communities again. Completely agree. Um, and you know, as you know, Chicago is thirty percent Hispanic and Latino, and so a meaningful part of our population is not able to participate in the parts of the economy that that others see as as possible. So, um, we've talked about about the small business and the service side, um, service based businesses, and I'm curious, how are you thinking about? you know, tech enabling these businesses beyond the the tool that you guys have built and or how you think about welcoming more um, Latino and Latina tech businesses into the Chamber of Commerce. Um, super. Let me let me start by, 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 I mean, before, let me do a quick parenthesis and say about like how proud I am to be Latino. I mean, this is to, to me being Latino is a celebration of life. 
just, I mean, I remember Octavio Paz and all the description about life and death and, and everything. It's a whole celebration of life. So I, I'm super proud of that. So now with that uh, context, I can go into, into answering your question. Yes, when we uh, we started uh, here at the chamber, when we, we do a lot of research, right? We have nine different programs from funded in different ways. We have a lot of access to information. So one of the questions we do across the program is uh, across all the programs, just to give you a sense, uh, we, we can reach uh, more than 14,000 businesses within the states in one year. Like that's an average uh, work that we do, right? And one on one, most of them are really small. Like let's think in someone doing tamales, let's think in someone doing thinking in, in, in selling uh, cupcakes, right? Well, one of the questions for all of them and also the big construction we have being primes, do you have access to internet? And they will say, yes, I have access to internet, right? Then further, we will ask, we will uh, find out what do you use it for? And then we say like, well, you are only using it for Facebook or, or to social media. It's not that you are actually implementing technology into your business. And that is that is a big problem for us because when we think in traditional businesses with really more of our base, we will find that, okay, yeah, it's construction. That might not require technology. No, that's exactly where this technology is needed, right? That's exactly where we have to build the capacity with technology, CRM, personal management, uh, payroll, like all the technologies. I just had, I just was in a conversation with exactly with 1871 about like how we can bring, because a lot of our businesses, they use a notepad, right? There's a notebook instead of on a spreadsheet and, and they can they wouldn't even think of having a dashboard to make decisions that will be like no 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 I rely only on my notebook and that is the way to do it well if you lose it then what do you do so the important part for us is how we can bring this I know okay participate in the in the public economy AI and all that but that sounds way too advanced for the businesses we serve how we can start getting them to participate is if that's your question well is just showing them what is the value of right uh, I, I mean we have multiple events uh, uh, going on expos and, and, and else but the idea is okay you can you can also have this dashboard you can also have access to this website we can do it for you all our services are for free we can help you we can sit with you and help you develop your website it's going to be a simple one but the idea is how you can reach and have an email with your name with the name of your company so they can reach at you you can you can expand and growth and scale but all the start with the question do you want to scale because that is when technology comes into place right for all the businesses and regardless of what a specific tool is I and mean, we know you know how to do your job. We know how, we know you we know, you know how to do your uh, bread, tamales, whatever you do, you, you know how to do it, right? Now, and you have a market because you have a natural market. You have the people that are, that gravitates around you that you sell your product. That's fine, and you know how to operate that. Now, do you want to scale? There is a question. If the answer is yes, well, you might need technology, any sort. A technology can be from a different type of knife, from a different type of cooking tools, from a super sophisticated AI, but they, and, and there there we are with experts and say like, well, we, then let us help you find, I mean, we don't have the answer, but let us help you ha answer that question. If you want to scale, bring technology on board. So we try to adapt that answer for every single entrepreneur. And again, I'm, I'm saying this from, and this is, this is, we have this story over and over and over from someone cooking uh, for small parties to someone doing construction, how they can access and tap into data. I just uh, had, a, we just had this week, um, a whole big, big analysis with legislation in, in town for, for a big firm in terms of analyzing every, uh, so sophisticated analysis, right? So what I'm saying is that there's the, the range for us as an Hispanic, as an Hispanic organization and also in the whole environment is really big going from the really small person doing, trying going from the notepad to the spreadsheet from the person that already have an, a dashboard and trying to go into a it looks like um, our judges are back to announce the winners, um, which we're excited about. But really quickly, Adrian, I want to say thank you so much for this and really excited for your leadership over there at the Hispanic Chamber and at um, the Latin Tech Incubator at 1871. I think we're going to have a lot of collaboration and looking forward to working with you. So thank you for being here today. Thank you so much, Israel. All right. Judges. I was, yeah. Who's announcing the winner today? And founders, if you come all camera on and audio on so we can do a little drum beat and exciting moment of, of celebration. All right, who's <laughs> announcing today? We're still so we, we, we have a disruptive, uh, a new <laughs> innovation today. So Flavia. <laughs> so I'll announce the, the second 
the runner up. Okay, the gotcha. Announcing the number one. Yeah. And before you say that, just so everyone knows, the runner up is in um, the running for the finale, which is the hundred thousand dollar prize alongside. And of course, the winner also is a potential finalist for the the finale too. That's why it matters that we have two top choices. Okay, so so runner up is um, Block C. Congratulations, Blexi. <laughs> All right. You are in the running for the finale for a hundred thousand dollar prize. Great job. All yes, right. Just wanted to say that you all everyone went great, by the way. And and we did, you know, uh had some difficulties on the breakout room to even pick that. So congratulations. I can tell because we're over on time. <laughs> you guys took too long, but I'm just kidding. Thank you. All right. And now the winner. And the winner is congratulations, Kariva. Oh, congratulations, ladies. <laughs> oh. I'm overtaken <laughs> with no words, but it's going to mean so much to um, continue our product development at MHub and get more of our intellectual property in the door. And, and I just can't wait to be on the floors of Northwestern Medicine, seeing our product actually impact every single patient. So thank you. <laughs> thank you all. And thank you for representing our culture so beautifully with your fantastic ideas. As a reminder, this is not a one and done competition. So you guys are welcome back on the TechRise stage and we're excited to support you through our you know, post uh, TechRise programming and our workshops and speed round and all the other ways that people come together. It's a really inspiring week this week. So thank you. And um, everyone else, we will see you next week for the next TechRise. Have a great weekend.